people. We come in a variety of shapes and sizes, colors and ethnicities. We define ourselves by our careers, our families, our hopes and our dreams. We find our identity in telling ourselves these stories about ourselves. Yet there is a story far greater than these. A story that is woven into the very essence of who we are and who we're meant to be. It's the story of us, of you, according to God himself. And it's only when we understand this story, when we understand whom he has called us to be, that we can live life to its fullest and become who we truly are. Good morning. So good to see you on what finally feels like a Christmas kind of December day. It's not 75 degrees outside, so it feels Christmassy. So glad you're here this morning. Let me just say, if you'll take a copy of God's Word, turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, We have two messages left in Ephesians chapter 6. We'll pick up in verse number 1 today. Just cover the first four verses. Um, I'm not going to preach verses 5 through 9 today. Just not enough time. Uh, I did a series on work and God's call to us on work. And I encourage you to go listen to that. We really covered chapter uh, 6 verses 5 to 9. We'll pick up on January the 1st, the first Sunday of the year, the new year 2023. We'll finish out Ephesians uh, chapter 6 there. So I hope that you will... Uh, be here for those Sundays. Let me just say by word of, of thought for just a moment about Christmas, and we're kind of about to enter that Christmas holiday schedule, no Wednesday nights, the next couple of weeks, and worship only on the next two Sundays together. I do want to encourage you to be a part of Christmas worship next Sunday. Uh, most of you got young kiddos, they're going to be up at, you know, four o'clock anyway, and so you'll be good and ready to probably take a nap by then, but I hope that you'll come be a part of Christmas worship. Again, I've had people ask me all this week, well, are we having church on Sunday? And uh, of course, you know what my answer is, of course, absolutely yes. Why would you not have church when Christmas falls on a Sunday? That's like saying we don't need to have it on Easter Sunday because it's a holiday. Uh, We're going to have it. In fact, I love the fact that it falls on a Sunday. It makes it that much more special to me. And so we'll be here together to worship. We're going to have candlelight together. Um, And so I look forward to that. I hope you'll come. If your kiddos need to come in PJs, bring them. It's fine. Invite your neighbor. Invite your friends. This is a great opportunity to invite someone. People are more open uh, at this time of year perhaps to come do a Christmas worship service. The second thing I'd encourage you to do around Christmas is uh, we have, uh, we'll have a Christmas live stream service on Christmas Eve. I think it's at 5 and 8. I think that's the right times when it actually is live. But after 5 o'clock, you can use it anytime you want to. Wherever you're gathered, that's the good news about it. So while we didn't really do it in-house, we'll do it four and seven. you say, well, that's, that's what time I'd like it to be, but I thought it was 5 and 8 because I'm uh, 8 o'clock, my brain shuts down. But so 4 and 7 is the times it'll actually be live. But again, after 4 o'clock, when it's over, it's about 35 minutes long. It's super short. I preached the world's shortest sermon in history for me. Uh, it's, it's 15 minutes. You just want to hear it. If nothing else, just to know that I can't actually preach a 15-minute sermon. Are y'all awake this morning? I feel like y'all are a little sleepy. That's like a amen, hallelujah. I was talking to the funeral home guy this morning, and uh, he said, you know, preacher, I've never heard a bad short sermon, ever. I've never heard a bad one. I've never heard anybody say, well, would you preach a little longer? Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll, it'll be a great time to gather your family. It's family friendly. We'll have worship. You can worship together. Wherever you may be, if you're not in town, you can do it away from town. Maybe you got family gathered together. Maybe some of those folks are lost. Well, just know that I share the gospel at the very end of that. And so it's a great opportunity to share the Lord with some family and friends that might be gathered for Christmas Eve. So I hope you'll take advantage of those. We've done those with great intentionality so that you can have a chance and opportunity to connect with people and to engage people with the hope of the gospel in order to see their lives transformed. Well, we are in our series of Ephesians of becoming who we are. And we talked about last week about marriage and stepped on our, each other's toes, men and women alike, of the challenges that are there. And I hope that perhaps you had some great conversations over lunch last week or maybe a dinnertime conversation about the calling that we have in Christ Jesus to become who we are, to be the, 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 the men and women of God in our marriages that God has called us to be. If you missed it, I encourage you to go back and watch it, uh, share it with a friend. It's a great opportunity to, to, to grow in our marriages together. 
together. This morning, I want to talk about what it means, uh, the charge to children uh, for those that are our kiddos, our preschoolers and children. So if you are 18 and below, would you raise your hand? If you're 18 and below, raise your hand. All right. Raise it high. Very, very good. Now, boys and girls, the very first part of this message, I want you to really, 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 really pay close attention. Not just because Santa Claus might be watching you, okay? But um, because he is. But I want you to talk about beyond that, much more important than that, about what God has to say to you. God has a word specifically for every one of you this morning. And I want you to catch it. And I want you to listen to the second part. I'm going to talk to your moms and dads for a minute, okay? And that's, and I'm including myself in that. And I want you to listen to that part too, because these are things that we are praying that God will, your parents will do for you and things that you can pray for your mom and dad as they try to be the parents that God has called them to be. And I want you to see this, though. This is not some self-help book. This is not uh, uh, 67 points about how to be a great parent. And these are not things to make us feel bad. These are things to encourage us, things that we, we perhaps might know that we need to be doing, but we need that reminder and encouragement to do those things that God has called us to do so we can become who Christ Jesus has called us to be in him. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, when I ask you to stand in the honor of reading God's word together, we'll read these four verses together, and then I'll share these two thoughts this morning. Verse number 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. So that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Lord, we come this morning to adore you, Christ the Lord. Lord, we come to greet you this morning and to give you all the glory, to praise your name forever, to join with the angels and the saints in heaven and all around this world today on the Lord's day that we lift our praises to you. And Lord, we declare that we need you. Lord, I know this is a Christmas season and for many this is a a festive time, a celebrative time, but for others and many of them, Lord, this is a hard season. And so Lord, that song that we sang, Lord, that you are Emmanuel, God with us, Lord, may they feel and sense your presence especially this day. And may the cry of their hearts be, Lord, I need you. I just don't need the baby in the manger. I need the the, the Savior that is Christ the Lord that has died and risen again. I need that resurrection power in my life today. God, I pray that you would speak to every heart and life today for all of us have something that you want to speak into our lives. To every parent, to every parent-to-be, for every child, student, child, kindergarten, whatever age they may be, that you would, Father, allow our ears to be tuned in to what you have to say to us. We give you this time and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you take that outline, you can follow along. If you're joining us online, you can go on the Bible app there. All that information is there. Jeremy DeCombs is so gracious, uh, works out of town, but does all this for us every single week. And if monitoring our chats, if you have questions or thoughts, you can certainly comment there uh, as you join us online this, this morning. Well, just three verses here that talk about this charge to children, right? Here is what he is. He gives three thoughts here. Number one, there is a very clear command. And it, God meant us no words here. The Apostle Paul gives us exactly what we need. The first one is this, obey them in the Lord. The word obey means to, to hear under, to listen with attentiveness and to respond positively to what is heard. And there is no if, there is no conditional clauses here. It simply says, obey your parents. Your sole responsibility when you are growing up as a child is to obey the authority of the parents that God has placed in your life. Now, boys and girls, listen to me carefully. I want you to understand something. It's not abnormal for you not to want to obey your parents. It doesn't make you weird. It doesn't make you unnatural. In fact, if you didn't always want to obey your parents, I might be a little alarmed because that's the way we're born. We're born sinners and we're born to be the word is called rebellious. It means that I want my way. I don't want to do what somebody else tells me I have to do. I want to do it my way. 
But God's word says that we are to obey our parents in the Lord. So just know on the front side, it's not always easy to do. In fact, sometimes it's really hard to do. And the older we get into our student teenage years, the harder it gets. Secondly, he says, not only do we do that with our actions, that's we obey with our actions. Secondly, he says, honor and respect them. This has to do with our attitude. Now, I can obey my parents, but I can obey them in different ways, right? So children, when mom and dad tell you to do something, you can do it one of two ways. I can say, yes, ma'am, and have, or yes, sir, and have a joyful attitude, or I can, you can do what I did sometimes, and I did it with my teeth clenched, and my attitude was terrible, right? Yes, ma'am, right? And I stomped off, or I stormed off, and I know none of you do that in this room, but I might have done that a time or two. Right? Your mom and dad may have done that a time or two. But the Bible says here we're called to honor them, to respect them. It means our attitude matters, not just if we obey them, but how they obey them, even if they don't see us. Right? I remember the time or two. I didn't do it many times but because I was afraid my dad would catch me. But I got through and I might, have, I might have turned the corner and turned around and got in my room and I might have given him one of these, one of these, you know. Did y'all ever do that before? Like some of you going, oh, I, I, I might have done that before, right? It's not honoring or respecting them, right? So we're called to honor and respect them, to show them reverence and kindness and, and courtesy, to respect them for who they are. And by the way, this command does not stop when you leave their home. We're still called to honor and respect our parents that God has placed into our lives. Now let's talk about the cause. We see the command. We know that perhaps pretty well, but Why? Well, two reasons. Number one, the Bible says there are, are four reasons, actually. Number one, it is right. The Bible says it is right, it is correct, it is just, or it is righteous. The, the right way is the only way that your family can thrive and be all that God created it to be. It is the right thing, even though it goes against our human nature. And even for your parents, by the way, kids, do you know the easier thing for your parents to do? And many times they want to do this, I can assure you, is just to say, fine. Fine, do whatever you want to do. I don't want to have to deal with you. I want to have to fool with you because it is hard some days being a parent. But the right thing to do many times is the hardest thing to do. The easier thing to do is to do it our way, but God says do it the right way. What does the right way mean? It means that it'll work. Not perfection, but if we'll do it God's way, the right way, it will work in the way that God intended. Secondly, because God commands us to do it, right? It is that command. It's an, it's, it's an obedience issue. It's a love issue, right? If I'm a follower of Christ, I will love and obey the Lord. That's my greatest desire. And again, not always easy to do. But the only time that you should never obey your parents is when they ask you to do something that will be contrary to God's word. Now, and I'll be honest with you, I've not been in many situations where I've met a teenager, is what I'm talking about in particular, that their parents asked them to do something that was, not, it was against God's word. I've, I've, once or twice. But that's such a rare thing. By and large, 99.8.9% of the time, we're to do it because God has commanded us to do it. Number three, because in obeying your parents, you're obeying the Lord. Right? The Bible tells us whatever we do, we do it unto the Lord. So if I'm obeying my parents, then in essence, I'm obeying God because God has placed them in authority over my life. And so when I obey them, I'm in obeying the Lord and their guidance and direction. And fourthly, the Bible says here there is a promise and a prize. Every time I read this verse, I cannot help but laugh because my dad's words ring in my ears. Verse 3 says, that it's so that it may be well with you and you will live long on the earth. My dad would tell me, it will go well with you, and you will live longer if you choose to do what I ask you to do, right? And he meant that he was not going to kill me, right? Now, not literally, though I'm sure there were days he wanted to do so, right? That's not what it's talking about here. No, that's not what it's talking about here. It's the second thing we might think is, does that guarantee that if I do what the Lord asks me to do with my parents, that I'm going to live until I'm really, really old? And the answer is no. It is not a guarantee. This is not a promise this is simply a principle of God's word that says if we'll do it God's way, which is the right way, then guess what? Chances are very high that we won't be involved in those things that are not of God, that are not the right things to do, and we'll live longer. Listen, here's the truth. Sin always robs us, and obedience always enriches us. 
There has been study after study for children who are raised in godly homes, raised to know and love the Lord, and parents who model that, who show that, who live that, who flesh that out, that their kids are much less likely to enter those dangerous behaviors that can happen as a part of teenage years. That I often hear people say as adults, well, you know, every teenager has those years. And my answer when I say to them is, that's not really always true. It doesn't have to be true. And so the the truth is, is that there's a promise and a prize here that if we'll follow God's call and obey our parents, Lord, because it's right, then there's a payoff in the end. Now, is there a payoff in the middle? No, probably doesn't feel that way some days. But it will help the relationship with your parents years down the line if you'll do that which God has called you to do. Number three, the call. I would encourage you as children to do four things for your mom and dad. And what a great time to talk about this. There's not a greater Christmas present you can give them. Your parents, 90 times over, would rather you give them these four things for Christmas than anything that you could possibly buy them this year. Minus a new set of golf clubs. That would be fine, okay? No, I'm kidding. Again, thank you. Shauna's awake. They're the only one that's awake in here. The rest of you are not awake. All right? So, I'm totally kidding. I don't need new golf clubs. But... Just to make the principle. Number one, understand your parents. I don't know if you know this or not. And moms and dads, we know this to be true because we were kids one time too. It is not always easy to parent you. Did you know that? Sometimes it is hard to parent you, right? In fact, it's harder than it's ever been, it seems, because of the onslaught of the culture that is raging against Moms and dads raising kids to know and love and follow the Lord and to make God first and church first in your family's life. It's harder than ever. There are so many things competing and yelling and demanding their attention and your attention as a child. But understand them. Listen, we wish that we could go to the library and go to the section M, W, and E for me and pull it out and have a manual for William, Matthew, and Emma that says, do this now, do this then. If this happens, do this. Wouldn't that be great? But you didn't come with a manual. You didn't even come with any instructions, really, quite frankly, other than what somebody told us or our parents or grandparents told us or some well-meaning friend. But God told us, try to understand the difficulty of being a parent the best you can. Number two, pray for them. And I mean this sincerely, pray for them. The younger you are, the more challenging this can be, but pray for them in the way that you know how. Pray that they'll love each other. Pray that God will bless their marriage. Pray that that God will bless them in their work. Pray, Pray that God will bless them in raising you. Now, Now, teenagers, let me just give you, and again, this is a great time to mention this. Because Santa is loading up his sleigh, okay, teenagers? Ask them this week and see the reaction. How can I pray for you, mom and dad? Now, some of you parents don't say what you're tempted to say. Who stole my child, right? I mean, are you possessed? I mean, I know it's Christmas. Is that why you're asking, right? It's a great time to ask the question. Mom and dad, how can I pray for you? Understand them. Pray for them. Number three, love and trust them. Now, one thing I've tried to instill in my children is is not be afraid of what their friends may think of them, right? You remember the time some of you were younger when you got about that age, about ninth or tenth grade, and you got to go to school. And up to this point, you'd hug them and kiss them and love you, and then they'd want to drop you off at school, and all of a sudden you became like you have leprosy, right? Like don't even think about it, right? Which, of course, then, if that ever does happen, I want to roll the window down and yell really, really loudly something completely idiotic, right? You know, that's the idea. But let me just tell you something. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed that your parents love you. You know, I want to tell you why that is. Being in student ministry for as many years as I was, 13 years, being a pastor of those other 20 years, I met teenagers who were so jealous of those families like that. And they wish their mom and dad, they'd have to tell them, stop, 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 right? They wish they did. 
Love them. Secondly, trust them that they will do what is right and what is best for you, even when you don't understand it, even when they say those dreaded words. And let me just give you a clue and a hint about those words, right? There were words I swore I would never say to my children. Parents, listen to this, kiddos. What were those words you promised you'd never say to your children? Oh, there's a lot of those right there. Okay, that's that's more than what I thought. That's good audience participation. I wish I could hear all those, but that was, I, I felt like we were all speaking in tongues right then. I could not, I didn't know what everybody said at the same time. That's what it sounded like in my ears. Here's the one I was thinking of. I don't know what the ones you said were, but, but I'm never going to say to my kids, because I told you so, right? Now, what does that mean, kids? Some of you are wondering, what does that mean? Because that seems really stupid. Well, can I just tell you, it, it really is in some ways, right? Because I swore I'd never say that to my kids because I wanted my parents to explain to me why. Well, it's called the last resort is what it's called, right? I just know it's wrong, and I can't give you the philosophical four-page litany of why it is that's not a good thing to do. I'm just your parent. You're going to have to trust me. I can see what you can't see. I've been where you can't be. Now, listen, I know. I know that you think as a teenager, your parents, when you get 13, your parents turn stupid. I know. And listen, on some levels we do, right? Just look at this stupid thing right here, right? People talk about it. uh, uh, Preacher, can you help me out? No, but you can call my nine-year-old. She'd be glad to help you out. She could figure your phone out, right? My 16-year-old knows. They know more about it. I just don't even. Now, I'm trying to be better about it, right? They're going to, let me just fix your phone. No, 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 no. No. Make me mad and fix my phone. No. Show me what you're doing. Right? And so on some levels, yes, that's teenagers, we don't understand some of the technology that you have. But please understand something. Though technology changes, the principles of life do not. And there are things that we've walked before, things that we've seen, things that we've experienced that we know when somebody says something, for example, it's not true. And we know it's not true. God gives parents special discernment and a radar and mom's eyes in the back of their head, right? To know these things. Love and trust them. Lastly, be thankful for them. Listen, you don't need to look very far to know how blessed you are to have the parents that you have. I I could take you to many situations and moments in my life where I've met people and I my heart would break for them. I would leave, watch them leave church and I would watch them and I would, my heart would break because I knew they were walking back into World War III. Be thankful for your mom and dad. Thanks goes a long, long way. Now, moms and dads, what's our charge? Well, very quickly, number one, three thoughts. Number one, we must be committed to a solid foundation. Let me reference just quickly last week If you want to have strong children, a strong family, you first have to start with a strong marriage, right? You cannot raise your kids at the expense of your marriage. I I have experienced over the years, people get to the empty nest, mom and dad look at each other, and they don't know who each other are. They've poured everything they had into their children and nothing into themselves. And after their kids leave, they just decide, I'm I'm done. I I don't really, I don't know you anymore. I don't really, I'm not sure we really have a relationship anymore. And they're done. Why? Because they didn't build their marriage. Now, is that a challenge to do in a season when you've got one, two, three, six kids? Yes, it is. No question. but, But where it starts is with a godly marriage. And see last week's message for that. Number two, we must be committed to raising them together. Now, this is a challenge, moms and dads, isn't it? Because we all grow up in different kinds of homes, right? Different kinds of backgrounds, different kinds of things happen. So God has to bring us onto the same page together. What do kids try to do, moms and dads? Because they're not dumb as we want to think that they are, right? They try to manipulate and work the system. How do they know how to do that? Because we did the same thing, right? If I were to ask your children, I could ask any of them. Now, watch this, moms and dads. Watch this. I could ask them, hey, kiddos, if you want to go do something, who do you go ask first? Uh, there we go, dad. You hear that? <laughs> dad, right there. There we go. <laughs> That's good. Good. Boy, dad, you just got out of right there. Bad right there. I mean, there was no, has, I should have said that was a true question. I think, you know what? I'm so proud you're listening to me. That makes me, that makes me so proud of you. Thank you for listening. There's some adults that don't listen as good as you just did just then. So I'm very proud of you, okay? Right? In my house, it would be mom, right? My answer is always no. 
Always. It's always my answer. I'm the fuddy-duddy whatever. Some of y'all know what that word means. Ask your parents later. Okay, it's an old word, right? It's no, right? So what do, what do kids try to do, right? They know who the person is to ask first, so they go and ask that person to try to work the system. What does that mean? Moms and dads, we got to be on the same page together, right? we got to learn how to compromise together. We're learning that still today in our own marriage, right? You have to learn. You, got, you cannot be one parent. I've seen families where the mom or the dad, whoever, would be easy, and they would go behind the other parent's back and give them permission to do something that the other parent had really said, this just can't work. You know what that creates? A disaster. It teaches kids there's a way around the system. And it puts a division between mom and dad. So parents be on the same page. Number three, we must be committed to connecting with our children. To connect with them on a deep level. This starts, by the way, when they're zero year old. Some people say, well, you start parenting when they turn two and they get the terrible twos. No, listen, parenting starts and spiritually instilling values in them begins when you bring them home from the hospital. That's how early it starts. Did you know the bulk of your child's brain development happens before they turn five years old? So what you instill in them, what our preschool department does under Ray Ann Carlisle's leadership is critical. It, you say, well, you know, bringing them to church on Sundays doesn't really matter. I, I promise you, it matters. It matters significantly that you'd get them here for life groups and worship, right? How do, how do we connect with them? Three ways, or how, how, do we, how do we love them? Three ways we love them. That's number one, love them by embracing them, by encouraging them, and by equipping them. By embracing them, by encouraging them, and equipping them. How, one way you love them, by the way, is let them see that you love each other, Right? And I don't mean you have to gross them out, although that is fun to do from time to time, but, but let them know that you love each other. You know what that produces in your child? Listen to me carefully. It produces security. On occasion, one of our kids over the years have come home and said, on occasion, Mom and Dad, are, are y'all going to get a divorce? And we're like, out of blue, like, I mean, best, I'm like, did we fight? Did somebody see something? I mean, what happened, right? Well, some of them had a conversation with a friend at school, and they, and they went into panic mode. No, no, we're not. Now, there are times your mom does not like me. That's for sure. I do really stupid stuff sometimes. But no, we're not going to get a divorce. What, what is loving them? It produces security. They know things are okay. And a kid needs security. That's how we love them. How, how do we love them? Really, we love them by their love language, right? Each child we love differently, right? There's not a favorite, boys. There's not a favorite, right? There, it's just different how we love each individual child and how you express that. But number one, express your children, your love by embracing them. And dads, I, I cannot overestimate this to you, and only because I've seen it firsthand. You need to embrace your children physically. Now, now some of you grew up in homes where your dad was incredibly unaffectionate. And, and there were a lot of men who grew up in that, that, that era of that great generation that physical expression was minimized and it was, you were considered soft. Let me tell you what, your children will look for affection somewhere else if they don't get it from you. So embrace them, hug them, right? They're never too old to climb up in your lap, ever. I did it when I was 25 and 30 years old and I wish to the good Lord's sake I could crawl up in my dad's lap today and he would let me. If he were still alive, I would. Embrace your children. Dads with daughters, especially embrace your daughters. Let them know that you love them in the right way. Number two, express your love by encouraging your children. Be your child's greatest cheerleader. And we see this sometimes, the opposite of this at the, at the ball field sometimes, don't we? You, you hear that parent that makes you just kind of cringe. And every time that child moves this way or that way, and you watch them almost become, they don't know what to do because the parents are yelling at them, right? Encourage your children. Be their greatest cheerleader. Tell them you're proud of it or you're proud of them. Thirdly, express your love by equipping your children, raising them to be godly adults. Listen, this is so important, and I have to remind myself of this often, right? Your, God has not called you to be your children's best friend. Which means sometimes you got to equip them to be, your goal is to make them godly men and women. That's your calling. 
with God helping you do that, that is your calling. And sometimes in doing that, to equip them, sometimes they're not going to like you when you do that. Secondly, we must love them. Secondly, we must laugh with them. Laughter is so good. I love to laugh. Good night. If I can find something to laugh with, we'll do that. Laugh at life. Life is too short. Life is full of too many sorrows. Find moments where you can laugh with your family. Right? Even if it means, mom and dad, you have to watch YouTube videos. Oh, y'all are acting so holier than thou. Moms and dads, I know you don't want to watch those videos, right? Every day, I've got, when I come home, Dad, I need to show you just these four videos. J- just these four videos, that's all. Just four, just six, just 12. You know, and I'm, I, you know, I, what do you do? You, and I'm, I'm telling on myself in front of my children, so I'm giving my secrets away, right? But, but listen, and they already know it by now, too, because that's why they say there's only four, because that's my limit. Four is it. I'm not watching more than four, right? I'm done. I don't want to watch more than four. Because why? Because we really, at the end of the day, you think, oh, I don't really care. But listen to me. If you care about your kids, you want to care about what they care about. Right? So so if it's something to them that's super funny, then you need to watch that. And sometimes it'll create laughter. So we watch YouTube videos sometimes instead of watching what I want to watch. Thirdly, learn with them. I love this one. Learn with them. You know what, moms and dads? Hey, kiddos, guess what? Your parents haven't learned everything. They don't know it all. They don't. And if we're honest, we'll learn together. Know what your children are learning when they come to church. Ask them questions. What did Charlie Morgan teach you, teenagers? What did Mr. Ryan teach you today? Right? What did you learn on Wednesday night? What are you learning at school? Learn with them. We never stop learning. We never tell us to stop learning. So we must be committed to a solid foundation, committed to raising them together, committed to connecting with our children. Lastly, we must be committed to instill godly traits in our children. I've only got a couple of minutes, so you're going to have to listen quickly, all right? Number one, instill correction in your children. Discipline is the word. Listen, discipline is one of the hardest things to do as a parent some days. It just is. Because it requires effort. It requires energy. You know that's going to bring conflict. I promise you, kiddos, mom and dad do not sit after you go to bed and think, all right, let's think there. How can we make our kids' lives miserable? <laughs> Which in turn makes our life miserable, <laughs> right? I never realized when my, my dad, when I would come in from something and I had done something I wasn't supposed to do, my dad never had to say a word. It was when I was driving, right? When, they let, when we were stupid and let people drive at 14 years old. Like, well, how stupid was that? But anyway, that was, and they would, here's all my dad would say, nothing. He would just hold his hand out and smile. That's it. You know what that meant? Give me your what? Keys, right? Some of y'all know, right? It, it wasn't, we didn't even have a conversation. He didn't even give a flip what the conversation was. He and mom had talked. But here's what I didn't realize. Until I had my own kids, to go take them everywhere is a pain. A pain. That's all I can say in church. It's a pain, right? In this side, back here, it's a pain, right? It's a much easier to say, fine, go ahead, Right? But listen, if we don't pay the price now, you'll pay the price later. So listen, this one begins when you have little bitty ones at home. Teaching them who is in charge in your home. Right? And that's not done by being, making your kids scared of you. It's by teaching them respect and to honor you. Right? And paying the price when they're younger, it'll pay off when they're older. Now listen, oh, there's just so much here. I'm just going to have to skip that. Golly dog. All right, number two, instill confidence in your children. Our world is going to tear your kids apart and tell them they are worthless. You must tell them they are worthy. They are worth something, right? Why? Because God says they are. It doesn't really matter that you say they are. God says they're worth something. God created them. They are the creation of a holy God who created them exactly like he wants them to be. And God's going to use you and others around you to help shape and form their life. Set high expectations for them, right? Not to be cocky or arrogant, but to be confident in who God has made them to be. Thirdly, instill conviction in your children. Conviction. Most Americans do not believe in absolute truth. And listen, that includes some of us that are sitting in this room. We really don't believe there's absolute truth. We believe it's it's relative. 
It depends on the situation. Yet we see God's word is very clear. Truth is truth. But if you stand on the truth, our culture says you are intolerant. We must teach our children more than ever in history, at least in modern history, what God's word says, what the truth is, and not only why, what they believe, but teach them why you believe it to be so. Listen, and, and the idea too, well, we've got to wait until they get to be middle school or high school to talk to them about the hard things. No, don't wait. Listen, do not wait. Ask, ask an upper elementary age teacher about the things that are being talked about in school. Matter of fact, ask your kids if they'll tell you, and you'll be shocked at what they'll be exposed to. Things that when we were growing up, we weren't exposed to until we were in junior high or maybe even into high school. We must teach them what the truth is. Satan doesn't wait till they get older, by the way. Satan's after your kids, after the heart of your kids and your students. And so we must be careful to teach them what the Word of God says and why the Word of God says that it is truth. Why we live these things out. That these are not just our opinions or our preferences. This is what the Word of God says. And if we'll do it God's way, the right way, it will be the best way. Number three, instill character in your children. Truth transforms your child's character. Listen, we can't just give our kids rules without building convictions in them. If you do that, all you get is outward conformity. I'll do what you say when you're around, but when you're not around, I'm going to do something entirely different. I'll never forget, I was an RA at Baylor University. We had not even started school yet. We'd been there like two days I had been an RA for all of like a week, and I got a call, the first, my first night on call as an RA, to help a young man who had passed out on the front lawn in front of his freshman dorm. He got kicked out of college before he ever even started. Why? More than likely, his parents told him the thing that they should do, and he was outwardly conforming, but when he got out from under them, all of a sudden, it was, there was no character on the inside of who he was. Number four, instill compassion in your children. Not pity, but compassion. Teach them to have the heart of a good Samaritan. To be compassionate for people. We can look down on people that are different than us if we're not very, very careful. And we can teach our kids sometimes those lessons without even saying it. May we teach them and may we demonstrate to them that we care deeply about people and show compassion. I'll never forget the time, and I've told this story before, and I'll just tell it incredibly quickly. My dad, we stopped one time back when going out to eat after church was a really, really big deal because there were very few restaurants open, and one of the restaurants we went to, it was special. This is going to blow y'all's mind. This is special. McDonald's. That's right. That's right. That line of cheeseburgers lined up, 40 of them sitting under the warmer. We thought it was fantastic, right? Y'all remember those days? Cold fries and cold hamburgers, right? We thought it was amazing. We walked in one day. I'd never seen my dad do this before. There was a a homeless guy, which we didn't see as many of those when I was growing up as a kid, sitting in McDonald's. And I watched my dad go up and buy him a lunch. We sat next to him and talked to him. And my dad didn't do this very often. First time I'd ever seen him do it, I was probably seven or eight years old. We took him downtown to the rescue mission downtown, the, the Salvation Army. The homeless shelter drove him downtown. Went all the way back down to downtown where we had just left from church. You know what that taught me as a kid? Compassion. So much so that when I went to Baylor, my dad said, Brad, you see all these people at the, at the, at the stoplights. Don't give them all the money that I give you. <laughs> you know why? Because I, he had taught me to have a heart of compassion. Lastly, instill love for the church in your children. Listen, I want my kiddos to know that I love the church, not because it's my job. Matter of fact, research would say preacher's kids are more likely sometimes to not be a part of the church than they are a church because they're required to always go because dad's always required to go. They're PKs. They'll have that label the rest of their life. But you know what I want them to know? I want them to know that I love the church because that's what Jesus loves. And Jesus gave his life for the church. And I've been called by God to give my life for the church, and I want them to do the same. Whether they're ever in ministry of any kind is irrelevant. 
Listen, you're called to disciple your kids, no question. It starts at home. But the church is a primary part of helping you raise your kids. Listen, here's the kicker. And I've talked about this before, but I'll say it again. If church is an option for your kids now with you, when they get to be older, the option will be far, far greater. When I started ministry, if somebody was considered active in church, they were there, watch this, three times a week. That was active. They were there Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I grew up in a youth group where, holy cow, I went to church probably on average six or seven hours a week. A week? Not a month, a week. Fast forward to 15, 20 years ago. You're active if you went twice a week 20 years ago. Fast forward 10 years later. You're active if you go four times a month. And now the statistics tell us people consider themselves active in their local church and love their church if they come once a month. Now, I'm talking to the choir here because you're here this morning, right? But do you see the danger? Where are we going to be in 20 years? Where are we going to be in 10 years? If that is the priority of your home, the church is non-negotiable. In my house, we don't wake up and say, well, are we going to go or are we not going to go? How we, how's everybody feeling today? They know. And some of you grew up that way. Well, that's being a little stiff with the children. I need to give my child a choice. That's what I hear. I need to give my child a choice. I had a choice. I had a real big choice. And it paid off for me, by the way, in the end. Here was my choice. Either go or pay the price for not going. <laughs> it was not a good one, by the way. Well, that just taught, that taught you that it was just mandatory. You know what it taught me? It gave me conviction. It let me know that was the right thing to do even when others chose not to. So I want to encourage you, parents, moms and dads, grandparents raising your kiddos, instill love for your children, for church. Obviously, mostly for Jesus, most importantly, but the church is a priority. And church family, as I close, and I'm shot over my time this morning, listen, we as a church family must be certain we take a stand for future generations. And can I just encourage you, church family? I, I, wanna, I just want to brag on you for a moment. Can I do that? In the last three years, I preached a message. I don't know what year it was. Chris and I were trying to remember the other day. 17 or 18, somewhere around there. And I challenged our church that we must make a, a dramatic shift in how we spend our resources and making certain we were doing everything possible to reach the next generation. In church family, you have responded to that by your giving in extraordinary ways. Right now, we have state-of-the-art everything for birth all the way to college. We have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to make sure our facilities were the best. Not only that, you've invested in staff. First time ever in the history of our church, we have a full-time preschool and children's minister. We have a new student pastor. Why? Because we believe as a church family that we must, we must instill Christ in the next generation. That is now. They're not the church of the future, dear church family. They are the church now. So I applaud you, Pedal First Baptist. Thank you. May we continue that investment by not only supporting it financially, but by supporting the ministries by making sure we have our kiddos here and apart and investing their life in that which will last forever. Would you pray with me this morning? Father God, I thank you for the opportunity to be together. Lord, I know this has been lengthy, but, and I know people tell me don't worry about that, but Lord, I always do because I don't want anybody to, to check out. I, there's so much in this passage of Scripture. And I, I pray, Lord, that every child has been encouraged this morning and also challenged that we all have room to grow in how we obey you by obeying our parents. 
And so I pray for every boy and girl, teenager, and in between, Lord, that they need to do business with you this morning about the kind of child and student that they are in their home. And maybe there's some adjustments they need to make, some things they need to confess or repent or say, I'm sorry, forgive me, to mom or dad maybe today so that we can become who we are in Christ Jesus and be the family that God designed for us to be. Lord, maybe for parents, I pray they were encouraged this morning. Many of them are already on this road, but for all of us, Lord, we could identify somewhere along that journey that we need to make an intentional effort in some of these areas in our parenting. So I pray these parents this morning have been encouraged this morning. Lord, they can do this. They cannot do it alone. We cannot do it by ourselves. Lord, we need you. Lord, if there's anything that teaches us we need you, it's being a parent of how much we need you and how grateful we are and reminded of your love for us as our heavenly Father. Father, finally, I pray this morning for any person that's never trusted you as Savior and Lord this morning, and that today, right now, where they are, where they're watching online or in this building, that they would today, if they're ever going to do these things right, they must start here. Lord, they would admit to you that they are a sinner, ask you to forgive them of all their sins, believe that you're the Son of God who came, born of a virgin, lived a perfect, sinless life, but died your sinner's death, rose again, and is coming again. We believe that with all that we are, confess you as our Savior, that we cannot save ourselves, and commit our life to you as Lord, that you are the boss of our life. I pray for any person that needs to make that decision, they would do that today, right now before they leave this building. Lord, for others who need to come and join this church family to come and maybe grab their whole family, come to the altar and pray. Lord, whatever it is you're calling us to do, I pray we'll be obedient to do it right now in these moments, I pray in Jesus' name, amen.